National Security Program here at CSIS. I want to welcome all of you here today uh, for uh, this great event. Uh, I've got the easiest job in the house today. I get to introduce the man who needs no introduction. Uh, the long story short here is Dr. Hemry, uh, who runs CSIS, had heard uh, Ryan Lance uh, and spoke with him at an event and just thought that, uh, that he was such an important figure and said so many interesting things that he invited him to come speak here at CSIS. Uh, but unfortunately, it got scheduled during a time when he is uh, away. Uh, and so uh, as a stand-in for him, uh, we are very pleased to have uh, with us today Rich Armitage, uh, former Deputy Secretary of State and trustee here at the board at CSIS uh, to do an introduction. So please, Rich. Well, good afternoon. I was going to try to pull off a John Hamry imitation today, but I'm about six inches too short and uh, a lot of other things, so I'll just uh, <laughs> go with myself. Look, uh, we're going to hear today from uh, a man who is, in my view, uh, uh, a paragon of leadership. Now, if you want someone who's going to introduce somebody by reading their bio, that's not me. You can read uh, Ryan Lance's bio, but I want to make a few comments from my point of view. I have the honor of serving on the board of uh, directors under uh, Chairman uh, Ryan Lance's leadership. Uh, you know, to get a sense of the size of ConocoPhillips, from over 19,000 employees, about an $80 billion market cap, give or take it <laughs> on any given day, <laughs> active in 27 different countries, uh, with, by the way, an absolutely fantastic executive leadership team, which Ryan has developed. I mean, these guys and gals are leaders in the entire industry. Uh, but here, what's fantastic to me about our chairman and CEO is that he's as comfortable in the wilds of Alaska, where he spent considerable time, as he is in the boardroom in Houston or New York, no matter in Washington. Ryan's as comfortable on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico or in Malaysia as he is walking the halls of Congress, as he's been doing for the last couple of days. And by the way, he's as comfortable in the cockpit of an airplane. He soloed at 13 uh, <laughs> as he is in any diwania or majlis in the Middle East. You know, I guess the, the thing that I would say and that I've come to understand about the oil and gas industry and our company, ConocoPhillips in particular, is that the chairman is someone who has to be able to simultaneously walk with cowboys and with kings, princes, and prime ministers, because that's what our chairman does. But let me tell you why I'm so high on the leadership of Ryan Lance. I one time had the opportunity to travel alone with him uh, to Norway, I think it was, and we were just chatting, and I asked him what was important to him. And without hesitation, he said, family, faith, and company. You know, think about it. That's the kind of leadership we want. I think he's got things on the right priority. And it's the type of representative we want for our nation as he travels internationally and de deals with Diwaniyas and Majlis and prime ministers and presidents. So ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of introducing uh, today's speaker, the chairman and CEO of ConocoPhillips, Mr. Ryan Lance. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Well, Rich, uh, thank you. I, um, I'm honored to, uh, to be here today, and it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for me and, and even to have one of my, uh, my board members here, so I have to make sure I'm on my P's and Q's because uh, performance reviews are in, are in February, so they're coming, uh, coming pretty quickly, but turn that off. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me okay through, the, through this? Okay. But it's great, um, and I really uh, appreciate Frank, uh, Sarah, the, uh, the opportunity, and, and please pass my uh, thanks on to John, too, as we, we got to know each other and talk a little bit about some of the issues that are facing our country as an, as an industry, an energy industry, some of the policy issues that are coming uh, as a result of some of the energy renaissance that we're seeing here in the U.S. Um, it, I thought it was an, an opportune time to come and spend a little bit of time with CIS, CSIS to have this discussion because it is a, uh, a pretty important time in, in our country's history right now with what's, what's happening in the energy business because we truly do have a, a renaissance that's underway. And I think you can view this really from four perspectives. Uh, first, it's a technology story. 
And then second, it's moved to a natural gas story. And from there, it's moved to an oil story. And then finally, and now, what I'd like to talk to you about today is an exports story. And this is, uh, entails policy decisions that we need to start grappling with as a country as we think about some of this energy revolution that's going on in the United States. You know, none of, none of this seemed possible back in the 1970s. We had energy shortages, we had an oil embargo, we had gasoline lines, we had factories and schools that weren't providing heat for their buildings, and we had rising import dependence. And the government did respond with regulations and policies intended to protect the consumers. Some worked, uh, some didn't. For example, certainly price controls cut domestic supplies, and they did create shortages back then. And for the next three decades, we saw both industry upturns and downturns, similar to maybe what we're seeing today in our business. But really, I wouldn't say not much progress in the overall energy balance. But today, I think we've re reversed those fortunes as an industry. And I think the U.S. now has assumed leadership, reassumed leadership role in the energy arena. We're passing Russia as the number one producer when you combine oil and gas together. Our production is climbing. Our imports are falling. We now have a century supply of natural gas in, this, in, the, in the U.S. LNG imports have virtually ended in the country. And we have multiple states and regions now that are booming from this energy development. Jobs are being created uh, by really the hundreds of thousands in, in the oil patch across all the regions of the United States and many outside the producing traditional areas that we've seen in the energy business. You know, this oil and gas business now supports 9.8 million jobs in the U.S. and contribute about 8% of our GDP. I think you've all heard the story. It started with homegrown technology, started with hydraulic fracturing back in the 1970s. Then in the 80s, or back, all the way back to the 40s with hydraulic fracturing. Then in the 80s with horizontal uh, directional drilling that this business did. And then the 90s, as we, in the 2000s, as we combined those technologies to exploit the shale rock that we see today. And by, I think, mid-2000, we'd cracked the code in this business. This new production revived the natural gas business in the industry. And then that renaissance now has spread to liquids. But there, there were other innovations in our business, Deepwater Gulf of Mexico, getting into the deep water environment, figuring out how to produce that economically. The Canadian oil sands, our neighbor to the north. And then we we're also applying a lot of this technology to older onshore fields as well. So today, we find us in a uniquely advantageous situation. We in Canada have a far greater energy supply security. Low gas is reviving, low gas, natural gas prices is reviving our industries. We're building new facilities by the hundreds. And in fact, even foreign-based companies are coming here to the U.S. to build. They'd rather build here than build at home because of cheap energy costs. And certainly, affordable energy has helped drive the U.S. economy forward. But we do face some challenges. But it's not, I repeat, not from the shale's staying power because we've really just scratched the potential in that business. Most of our new production comes from a, uh, just a handful of giant fields. You've heard some of the names, Eagleford in Texas and also the Permian Basin and the Barnett. You've heard North Dakota, the Bakken in North Dakota, the Marcellus up here in the east. They hold enormous amounts of hydrocarbons, tens of billions of barrels of equivalent. And our recovery factors are rising. How much of that oil we get out of the ground? That's thanks to more density, better science around hydraulic fracturing. And in the best areas, we're finding pay zones that are, are dramatic. They're very thick, and they're stacked on top of each other. So we're climbing, climbing that learning curve on this shale production, and we're getting more efficient all the time. Meanwhile, several dozen potentially productive, productive trends in both the U.S. and Canada we haven't even gotten to fully exploit. So the message is this, isn't, this is the first inning of a nine-inning game, and it adheres here for the long term. So our energy challenges really aren't from scarcity. They're from success. The natural gas is nearly at a surplus in North America. We plan to export of it, some as LNG or liquefied natural gas. It's wanted worldwide for its environmental benefits and also for the supply security that we offer as a nation. And by 2016, just next year, you'll start to see LNG, we become a net LNG exporter as a country. And I think this is really viewed favorably overseas as they, uh, as they contemplate this uh, new paradigm in the U.S. 
the natu our natural gas prices are half of those in Europe and a third of those in Asia. Now those spreads have eroded a little bit lately and with the, in, in the, in the, the cost to ship and the cost to liquefy that does, does present some, uh, some competitive opportunities, but really our LNG is gonna be competitive worldwide. And our abundance can accommodate both the exports that we are gonna make as well as domestic consumption here in the United States. The exports aren't gonna drain our surplus. There may be some limiting factors, competition from Australia, competition from the Middle East, from Asia Pacific. It's gonna cost us six to seven dollars per million BTU to move, to liquefy and ship this LNG to our customers. But that still means the US consumers have a built-in advantage. But we have plenty of supply to satisfy both our US consumers and the exports that we're talking about. The DOE has studied it. They've approved you know, 10 or so billion cubic feet per day of exports. It's only 10 to 15% of our current consumption. And they've examined the results and thought about even higher volumes of LNG being exported as much as up to 20 BCF. Although they deem those levels unlikely, they still have studied it and said the U.S. consumer will have plenty of gas, uh, natural gas to consume. In return for exporting this natural gas, we're going to see meaningful benefits. They create new markets for our domestic production. You know, the prices to producers might rise a little bit, but that's good because that means we have more money to reinvest to put back into the development of more gas. We create jobs and economic stimulation. The balance of trade improves. And there's more. NIR did a study for the DOE. It predicts that the GDP would rise somewhere between five to $50 billion through exports. Now that exact amount depends on the production level that we ultimately export. So I think you'll agree that exports in general are pretty vital to the economy. The US is the world's second leading product exporter. Products and services together generated 2.3 trillion in exports in 2013, one seventh of our GDP. Now the next aspect of this renaissance is its move to oil and to liquids. With natural gas approaching a surplus, and the development of that has really slowed down because of that surplus, waiting on more demand and exports, instead this industry has turned to liquids and we're approaching a surplus there as well. Let me give you a few numbers just to ground everybody. 1970, we peaked at a nation, as a nation at about 11 million barrels a day of production. It fell for the next 30 years and bottomed out at about 7 million barrels a day in 2009. But now we've climbed back up just in that short period of time back to 10 million barrels a day. The DOE predicts 12 million barrels a day production from the US by 2020 and their high resource case predicts 18 million barrels a day by 2040. So there you get a sense that this is a revolution that has staying power and a lot of growth potential. And at the same time, our friends to the north of Canada have made progress. They're producing now 4 million barrels a day, and that could be increased 50% by 2030. And that role is right next door in a friendly, reliable country. It's the world's third largest oil resource, and we're the logical market here in the U.S. But meanwhile, our U.S. demand is pretty flat. And we've mandated the, of, uh, the, uh, the use of renewable fuel. And we are building and running more efficient cars and trucks. And as you know, we still import some oil. Both U.S. and Canada production together are climbing. They're approaching that total demand. And they'll exceed it in the very near future. So we and Canada together become net exporters of crude by 2020. Now, you might say, what about the low prices today? Well, yeah, there are low prices that will infect investment, and it might take a little bit longer, but that's the trajectory we're headed on here in both North America and in the U.S. Now, as for the crude oil market, for efficiency, it should involve both imports and exports, and I know that's counterintuitive, but let me give you some underlying facts. Shell Rock, this revolution that we're undergoing in, in the U.S., is made up of really condensate and what we call light oil. So it's very light, sweet crude that doesn't have a lot of impurities in it. And it's very different from heavy oil, the kind of oil that comes from Venezuela, Mexico, and from Canada. That oil has a higher sulfur content, takes more to refine it. Now these two, these two, light and heavy, require a different refining configuration to turn that crude into gasoline and to diesel. The light oil that we're producing from this revolution in the U.S. isn't a good match for our Gulf Coast refineries, or our West Coast and some of our East Coast refineries as well. They were configured years ago to run the heavy crude that Venezuela and Mexico is producing. 
Now to process more of the light oil that we're developing in these unconventional plays, they have to operate inefficiently. So they have to run at reduced rates, they have to operate inefficiently, or for them, they gotta discount the oil to get them to incentivize to take it into their refinery. And it costs higher processing costs for them to, uh, to refine it. Now the IHS and others have studied this issue and they found that the discount could be as much as 10 to $25 a barrel. So that's a pretty significant discount in order to incentivize the refiners to take this light sweet crude. That becomes a pretty big hit to the producing side of the equation, puts less capital in to reinvest back into the business to continue to grow and develop and grow the production out of the, uh, the shale. And that crunch time is coming. It's coming pretty quickly. Light oil production already exceeds refining capacity seasonally. And uh, so during the fall and the spring, when the refinery is going to turn around in maintenance sessions, they can't take the volume of light sweet crude that we're producing as a country. And that seasonal surplus will become a year-round annual surplus starting in 2017 and certainly beyond. Now, what can the refiners do? We can, they could invest more money to expand their capacity to take this light sweet crude that we're producing as a nation. But that's going to roughly cost them $400, $400 million per plant. Certainly a challenge getting the permits to do that expansion. They're already making investments to meet tighter restrictions on gasoline uh, specifications. And certainly getting the permits on the air side and the mercury side and some of the others are going to be very difficult. So we need to talk about this issue today. We need to talk about it now. We're seeing the seasonal surpluses. That 17 threshold really is only two years away. And the estimates are by 2020, we'll need to be exporting one and a half to two million barrels of crude a day. Otherwise, we face a threat to this development and this renaissance that we're seeing in the US. You know, and our country needs these energy industries, jobs and creation and economic stimulation. It's been good for the country. But there is a perfect storm of converging threats. First, you got the depressed US natural gas market. I think the LNG imports will help that. Second, this discount that we see on domestic light oil. And third, the oil price downturn that we're currently experiencing. And that downturn will probably have an impact. U.S. light production was up one million barrels a day just last year. Now some predictions it'll slow, growth will slow to about 700,000 barrels a day this year. A bit less maybe the year beyond that. In many of these planned light oil projects, they break even at $70 a barrel. They'll start becoming uneconomic at various prices below that, and the vast majority probably uneconomic below $40. So the, so the current market does have an impact, certainly in the investments that's available to continue the growth. Um, but you can see a danger that happens if you have a discount between the WTI, the prices that we pay for, uh, for oil here in the U.S. Now those prices today, WTI range is about $45 to $50 a barrel, and it worsens uh, as we go on in this, this uh, supply uh, uh, bubble goes, goes through the system. Fewer projects will break even, the cash flow for investments will fall, and uh, we're also disadvantaged competitively against our foreign producers. You'll lay down drilling rigs, more jobs will be gone, and the U.S. economic uh, stimulation will start to be reduced. So this price challenge won't stop all the activity because some of the better areas in the uh, shale are still quite productive. Some remain economic, their resources are there, and uh, we have that rising ability to produce and get more efficient in the shale. So the economics will have to improve some as those innovations take hold. But our growth, our growth will slow down, certainly at these low prices, but it won't stop. And that's what's important, it won't stop. Because we've changed that structural situation for the U.S. oil and gas outlook as we've gotten more efficient and we understand how to produce these unconventionals. But that, what, what a potential reduced activity level will do is cause impacts not to our industry, but to the U.S. in general. But there is a solution, but it does, does have several parts. And uh, first, it's the heavy oil issue. Uh, traditional supplies are falling in Mexico and Venezuela, uh, but the Canadian oil sands can replace them. And uh, that is that the Gulf Coast refiners can get this oil economically. They need to get the econ we need to get that oil economically down to the Gulf Coast. So certainly approving the Keystone Pipeline is, is a vital piece to that. Otherwise, we're going to move oil by rail, which is certainly more expensive and a bit more, uh, more dangerous. Second, we start exporting. We can start exporting our surplus oil. That's the full oil that the refineries cannot process economically today. But there is a roadblock, and it's the federal law. Since 1975, the Energy Policy and Conservation Act has prohibited crude oil import, exports. But there are a few exceptions. There's some into Canada, oil from Alaska, but the ban is really out of date. 
Uh, times have changed, and for the better. It's a new world that we live in today, so policy, policy so should change as well. Now, the government can and should address this issue. It should allow for broader crude oil exports. It can be done either through executive or legislative action, but something must be done. Otherwise, in today's low oil price environment, we'll lose even more potential production growth down the road, so we should take action. And we should do it before we cross the year end, and certainly before the 2016 election cycle. Otherwise, it will certainly complicate the discussion politically. We should treat crude oil just like any other potential export product that we have in the U.S. today. You know, as you know, U.S. participation is vital to the trade and global leadership that we provide. Even now, we're speaking in terms of TPP negotiations with Asia and also the TTIP negotiations in Europe. We should adopt that same philosophy on oil. We should open the market to normal trade flows. We do it for all the other products that we produce as a country. And by the way, the U.S. is the third largest U.S. export by dollar volume is oil products today, the third largest export. It's gasoline, it's diesel fuel. There can be exported illegally, but not the crude that makes and generates the gasoline and the diesel. So we've made a little progress. The administration now considers natural gas liquids and some process condensates as exports. So they can be exported, and it's certainly a step in the right direction, but it doesn't provide the relief needed. It, it, it really is targeting a very, very small development, small area of production in the U.S. We should repeal the crude oil export ban. We shouldn't treat it differently from other products like natural gas. They're all just commodity energy sources, and they can be traded profitably to the benefit of the United States. Now, several studies have, have, have looked at those benefits. Uh, Brookings, uh, U.S. production would increase by 3 million barrels a day by, uh, by repeal of the export ban. Jobs would be created. Income would be generated from the service supply and support industries. Household income would grow. IHS tells us that the industry would make $750 billion in added investments through 2030. Certainly a lot of stimulus. Uh, annual GDP would gain $135 billion at the peak. We'd add a million more direct and indirect supply chain jobs. And our trade balance would improve by $67 billion. The government, $1.3 trillion of additional tax and royalty revenue. And that's split between the federal government, the state, and the local governments. Everybody wins. And the consumers win. They get lower gasoline prices. And I know that seems counterintuitive. We're going to export and we're going to get lower gasoline prices. But when the world oil price comes down, fuel prices, gasoline prices come down. And that's true worldwide. It's true here in the United States. The discounted light oil that we've seen in the past has not led to lower gasoline prices because it hasn't had the ability to get into the open market and reduce the global price of oil. So by adding our exports to that global market, it will, will help reduce fuel prices. Now studies by government think tanks and, and energy consultancies agree on this issue. You know, it's the Brookings, Resource for the Future, the Reserve Bank from Dallas, IHS, EIA, ICF. And all of them estimate the savings on gasoline could represent $18 billion annually, 9 to 12 cents a gallon. So the consumer benefits. And then think about the geopolitical benefits of exporting our crude. We could help stabilize the oil market, the growth of oil market, get the ups and the downs stabilized. We've already seen that happen. You know, our new light oil production now, we've, we've added 3 million barrels a day of light oil production over the last four to five years. And that has backed out 3 million barrels a day of imports that we would bring into the U.S. And that's about the same amount of production that we've lost due to some of the geopolitical events in the Middle East and North Africa, places in Libya and Iran and Iraq. So the production that we've added as a country, this 3 million barrels a day that we brought on in light sweets, backed out imports, stabilized the global market, offset the loss of production from some of these countries. And some estimates would tell you that if we hadn't had that circumstance, all things being equal, the Brent price would have been $12 to $40 higher if we hadn't had the 3 million barrels a day of production coming from the U.S. But once we finish backing out all the imports of light oil that our refineries need, after that our influence is going to start to decline. There are going to be no more light oil imports left to back out, so through oil exports we can continue to maintain that influence. We can still influence the global market. It would certainly supply, diversify the supply base and create a more competitive market. The crude oil exports would also demonstrate our commitment to free and open markets. After all, there's a lot of countries that want the goods that we produce and they expect them to export them to us. 
They may not, and, don't, and they want to get access to the surplus light oil that we have as a nation. Certainly it enhances our foreign policy leverage. We could provide more supply security to the globe. And certainly the countries that need that are important to get access to this excess supply that the U.S. has. And exports would shift revenue back to the U.S. and away from some of those less reliable suppliers. Exports would enhance the global power that underlies our global influence. Again, we would be exporting our high value oil while importing lower value, lower quality heavy oil. But keep this in mind, we're only going to export our surplus oil. U.S. refiners would still have as much light oil as they need to run their refineries. They'd have a competitive advantage over the foreign refiners. And that's because it costs us two to six dollars a barrel to export this crude to other locations. So the U.S. refiners are taken care of, and we're talking, they have a built-in advantage, and we're only talking about exporting the surplus that they can't handle today, and the growing surplus that they won't be handled tomorrow and into the future. And the U.S. refiners have another built-in advantage relative to their foreign competition today, and that's cheap natural gas prices. That's also come from this energy revolution in the shell production. We've flattened the price curve. We've lowered the cost of natural gas. And anybody who's a manufacturing industry that relies where energy is an important part of, uh, of their cost structure, we've certainly made them much more competitive in the global environment today. So in closing, I would say we've got a big job ahead of us to con certainly convince the policymakers and the public on this important issue. But we first have to change the mindset around scarcity, because that's gone. It's really a holdover from the last century. But certainly memories have a long, long history, and they take a long time. But I'm here to tell you, this, this energy renaissance in the U.S. is real, and it's here today. And it's here for the long term. This is not just something that will come and go quickly. And it continues to serve as an important part of the U.S. economic uh, engine of growth. And we can help that by ensuring that we recognize these new realities and allowing the exports. So I hope you'll join me in, in helping tell that story. So thank you, appreciate your time, and I look forward to uh, answering some of your questions. So I'm Frank Verastro. I'm a senior vice president here, and I have the Schlesinger chair. Um, the last time that Ryan was here was 2012, and I mentioned that to him upstairs. Uh, it was the same week he was here that he was named CEO of Conoco. And his response was that it was a doubly auspicious week for him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we thought it was time to get him back in his, in his new role. Um, and during that time, I, I got to tell you that our recollection among the staff was that you were calm, articulate, short-term, you know, technically proficient, but could tell a story. And this is what this industry needs right now is an articulate spokesman that's thoughtful and gets the word out. So we hope you'll come back here many more times. Uh, I'd be happy to. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right, we're actually marking you down. <laughs> um, the amount of questions that we have. So I've decided that I wanted to start off with um, your CEO role so that we do some operational things and then we'll raise it to the, the policy issue question and then we want to save time at the end so that our participants can ask questions as well. And that's what we do in these forums. But starting, so when you first took this job in 2012, you repositioned the company. And as Richard said, your largest independent uh, if you look at exploration, production, and reserves uh, in the United States, but you have production in 27 countries, and it's across all, all forms. So you're in the deep water, you're in the shales, you're in the Duvernay, you're in the oil sands, you're in the unconventionals. When you look out and try to decide, especially in a $40 market, where you put that money, and you look at the maturity of projects offshore versus onshore, how do you make those determinations? Yeah, I think it's a really good question because we have a lot of opportunities yeah. in front of us. And I think what the shale revolution in, in North America has done is uh, kind of uh, twisted the whole capital allocation issue in companies like mine on its head a little bit. And that's because uh, companies that were pivoted quickly and moved into these opportunities in North America now have a huge investment opportunity in their company. But they're different shapes and um, different profiles for these opportunities. These shale resources, they're very drilling intensive. You get drilling rigs out there. They have uh, really good uh, uh, initial rates. They decline really quickly. So you have to keep drilling and keep the manufacturing process going. It's about efficiency. It's about capital efficiency. 
in getting those down. And they're an important part in your portfolio as a company because they generate very significant returns. And when you, when you hear me talk, and in our company, we talk about what we refer to as cost of supply. I have to explain that in a minute. It's the oil price that it takes to get a 10% after-tax return on your invested dollars. And what we see is the cost of supply of the unconventionals in North America are very competitive with all the investments that we could be making around the world. But if we just made those investments as a company, then we, we would be reliant on, on one particular geology, one geography, one product type in one area. And, uh, and for a company our size, with the capitalization, with the capacity that we have as a company, we, we feel like being uh, diverse and global is very important for a company like ours. And being part of some of the mega trends that are developing in the world today, whether it's deep water, Arctic, LNG, unconventionals. So in our company, we think having a diverse opportunity set to allocate the capital across is very important in, the, in a volatile world that we see today where differences in uh, Brent and WTI can blow out, gas becomes cheap in the US, but it's worth a lot in, if you can supply it to Asian markets. So having a diver, diverse but not diffuse portfolio I think is important. And, but as we think about capital allocation, you, know, you need a little bit of all that in your portfolio because even though there might be lower return investment opportunities in, in oil sands or big LNG projects, they also last for 40, 50 years. And they have very little decline because they're backed up by a tremendous amount of resource. So having some of that in your portfolio is important as you try to manage across all the competing metrics in this business. And as you do that assessment, you look at both the above ground and the below ground. Right? And I think that's really important. So as you're going globally, we start and want to assess the subsurface. We want to understand what the risks associated with development are, but we have to marry that with the surface risk, the fiscal system, the rule of law, the security situation, uh, all those kinds of things come into our calculus as we try to make those decisions as where, where to spend the capital. So one of the questions the Washington community frequently asks is how resilient at a 40 or $50 price is the U.S. industry? And we had spoken earlier about investment decisions and dollars spent in 2012, 13, and 14 kind of set the stage for where you are 2015, 2016. Can you talk about that lag a bit? Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit. People are saying, well, what, what will be the rate of growth and the increase in the, in the U.S. production in 2015? as a result of having 40 or $50 prices that we're seeing today. And, uh, and the reality is the, the, uh, the rate of growth or the amount of production probably is not going to be heavily influenced by the price today because we made investments the last two to three years that are now coming into production in the unconventionals in North America in 2015 and 2016. What will happen if lower pr prices persist is we're, we're a very capital intensive business. So of all the revenue, and, and you see the numbers that come out of the revenue, we get a lot of press for that. But the important thing is we and reinvest up to 80 and 90 percent of the money that we make back into the business in capital. So we, we make a lot of investments. And uh, so as, as our cash flow comes down, as commodity prices come down, we have less to invest back into the business. And that will impact ultimately the rate of growth in production from the unconventionals. But the important thing, and I tried to allude, this, allude to this in my speech, is we do believe the cost of supply in the unconventionals is very competitive to whatever investments, most of the investments companies have around the world. So even in a, you know, they're resilient down to 60 and $70 a barrel, cash break evens are even much lower than that. So the, these are investments that will continue, but certainly as companies have lower, less amount of cash to reinvest in the business, it will impact the amount of capital that we're going into and the absolute amount of, of growth we can see over the next couple of years. Excellent. So I have to make a plug for our program here. The last two years, we've been looking at an infrastructure project with the belief that even as the EMP side, the production side, moves up the supply curve, unless you get the infrastructure built out right, it doesn't deliver the goods to where you need it. And with yeah. Conoco and other companies' support, we've been able to do that. But can you talk about the the importance of actually making sure you have attended and supportive infrastructure. Yeah, and that's, that's an important piece too because you can't go drill the wells unless you can evacuate the product, right. the, the, the natural gas and the, and the crude oil and the condensate. So you look in our business over the last five years, there's been a tremendous amount of investment into the midstream, what we call the midstream space, into the pipelines and the facilities to move this product from the producing areas to the refining areas and to the places that... Uh, that can consume the product. And that's, and you'll see that, uh, you know, the Eagleford was built out over the last couple, three years. Uh, the Bakken is trying to do that mm -hmm. today. We're railing as an industry, we're railing too much 
uh, crude out of the Bakken, we need to get more pipeline capacity in place, more midstream capacity in place to make sure we're doing that efficiently. The Permian will be the next spot because that's where this revolution is headed next. And even though it's a 100-year-old basin that's been producing oil for a number of years, Again, the kind of oil that we're going to be producing out of these unconventional rocks is different than what we've been producing out of the Permian for the last 100 years. So we need more gas plants. We need more infrastructure to handle the natural gas liquids. And the type of product that we're going to be evacuating out of the Permian Basin is going to be different. And that's what I don't pe think people appreciate. Oil is not just oil. Condensate's different than oil. And natural gas liquids are different, too. And we have to put that infrastructure in place to safely evacuate it and get it out. Now, as we move that bottleneck, that's why exports are important. As we continue to grow our production and we continue to consume the capacity that our refining industry has to take this unique kind of light oil, three things are going to happen. We have to shut in production. We have to expand refineries. Or we have to lift the export ban. One of those three things have to happen. And I think we question whether or not all the refineries will make the expansions necessary to consume the excess volume. No one wants to shut in production. That's bad for the royalties, the taxes, everything that the country is making, the economic stimulus and the plans. So the logical solution is to remove an, an export ban that was put in place in a completely different time frame for North America and for the U.S. and, and really, really modernize that policy to be reflective of what's happening in the industry today. Well, it would also be consistent with just Americans' position on free trade, right? We, we import and export widgets that we need. We import other things that we need that we don't have, export what's in surplus. And you can talk about the quality, and I know you mentioned it in your speech, but the fact that we're going to be in surplus with light, there's also a global refining industry out there that uses a lot more heavy because that's what we thought we had more of. Yeah, I think that's correct. I think as we look at the assessment, there's enough capacity for light, sweet refining globally. We'll consume all that capacity here in the United States. But as you look to Europe, to Africa, to South America, and even over to Asia, there is spare capacity for refining this light global product. So we need to get it into the open market. And the best way to stabilize that, that global market, reduce the ups and the downs that we see in the volatility, is to get more supply into the market. And I think not only from the trade benefit, but for, certainly from easing the volatility of the global markets, getting U.S. crude exported and into that global market is the right thing to do because yeah. it'll let the market decide. And, and the market's pretty smart at doing this. Mark, it knows uh, you know, where the imbalances are at and, and moving it around. And again, our U.S. refiners have a built-in advantage because it costs, costs extra transportation dollars to move the crude. So we are talking about the excess that they can't handle. Yeah, and even on the foreign policy side, I mean, I always felt that, that U.S. light oil by displacing Algerian, Angola, and Nigerian, that helped ease the burden of the loss of Libya because it yeah. was light oil. You know, Saudi increase in production offset the loss of Iraq. So the, there's different operations in the market that are And that's now. where the, this business is uh, geopolitical. It's globally interconnected. The world's becoming more globally interconnected. And by not having all the oil globally interconnected, we get those kinds of things. What we have done in the U.S., the three million barrels a day that we've increased our production in the U.S. of this light suite has backed out exactly what Frank has said. So we're not importing Nigerian oil. We're not importing as much Angolan oil. We're not importing as much Saudi light crude, Middle Eastern light crude, Iraqi light crude. And that's, what, that's been the benefit to this is a more secure supply here in the U.S. that's backed out foreign imports. But we still want to bring in the Canadian heavy we still want to bring in heavy crudes into our refineries because they're tooled up to efficiently run that. So that's this, this uh, contradiction that, that is tough to explain why we want to export at the same time we want to be importing. But it makes imminent amount of sense. It's the right thing for the U.S. to do. So every time I listen to you, I, I get in a situation where I think of other questions, right? So this, the net gross issue, we tend to talk about U.S. independence, energy independence. But it's on a net basis. We, the logical thought is that we will be importing mm -hmm. and exporting to make products that we need and products that the world needs just because it makes the most economic sense. Absolutely. I, and I think that's how the markets work. And that's not unique to oil. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly true. So in, in today's remarks, and I've heard you say this before, you know, we talk about the energy challenges, especially of low price, that it's a, it's a two-thirds demand story and a one-third supply story, right? So as, as people continue to produce more oil, and I suspect going into 2015 to keep 
cash flow current, folks will try to be as robust as they can, which makes the situation, at least for a while, worse or, or bad until new demand surfaces or there's a big disruption. So this, we're going to be living with this for a little while? Well, I, you know, there's a, a number of people. This is for the day traders. Yeah, right? a number of people that prognosticate. My, my crystal ball is probably as clear as anybody's here in the room. But I think uh, the, the supply demand imbalance, some will say as high as 2 million barrels a day. I think people put it between 1 and 2 million barrels per day. It's different than what happened to us in 2008 and 2009. So I do think a lot of people are watching the demand side. What happens in Europe? What happens in Asia? What happens here in the United States? What, um, we've kind of flattened our demand due to efficiency and, and uh, higher fuel standards for our, our vehicles. But the growing demand in Asia is really where all eyes are upon it right now mm -hmm. to see. If we can get back to growth as an industry, growth of about a million barrels per day, that'll probably consume the excess supply pretty quickly. Now, if growth is going to maintain at a half a million barrels a day, it's going to like take longer to get through the excess supply that's there and, uh, and get back to, say, a, a mid-cycle equilibrium on price. I think 2015 is going to be a difficult year for our business. Uh, but I think uh, most people would say we start seeing some recovery in 15 and into, the into 2016. And we talk about a lot of people feel that lower prices are good for the economy generally. But there's a difference between the oil and gas industry jobs and the kind of salaries and benefits that they bring versus uh, not to cast aspersions on a Kmart or, or a restaurant, but it's, it's a different kind of business and a different salary scale. Yeah, it is. I think the jobs that we've added, and I quoted some figures, 9.8 million, million jobs, the jobs that this industry add are very, you know, pretty high paying jobs that come with uh, pretty significant health and welfare benefits to our employees, retirement benefits to our employees, uh, pretty qualitative 401k plans for employees on top of base salaries that are, you know, uh, recognizing the value that the employees bring to the business. So the jobs we are creating and the follow-on, the indirect jobs that support our industry are all very, very high paying quality, the kinds of jobs that we want to be creating here in the United States. And upstairs earlier when you were talking about it, it's, it's actually the best and simplest explanation I've seen about the difference between the source rock and having it migrate uh, into conventional plays. But I think it's important because people don't understand what's actually going on. Yeah, and I think that's incumbent on industry to educate a little bit more. When we talk about light and heavy crude, it's vernacular that we use that we're kind of rolls off our tongue that people really, really may, may not appreciate. You know, heavy crude's a different kind of oil than light crude. You know, light crude being more similar to what you might put in your engine and uh, heavy crude being something that almost uh, in the ground looks like a hockey puck. And uh, so there are, oil's not oil. And as we go into these unconventionals, the important thing, again, the kind of oil that we're producing out of these unconventionals, the revolution that we're seeing today, the three million barrels a day of growth is coming this light, sweet crude. It doesn't take a lot of refining to turn it into gasoline and diesel. Heavy crude takes a lot of refining to turn in. The crudes are different. And in these unconventional plays, not only is it compounded on the different types of black oil, in these unconventional plays, depending on where you're at in the, in the underground subsurface in the reservoir, you could have condensate, which is something different than oil. You could have natural gas, and you could have what are called natural gas liquids. They're all different product types, and they're unique to various spots in each one of these plays. So the, the, the midstream investments, the kind of refining investments we have to make, that's why we have to continue to invest more money uh, to be able to evacuate these specific kinds of products and go to the places that can consume them either directly or through some refining process right. and not wait for that complete infrastructure to get built out in the U.S. because it'll, 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 it'll throttle back the growth. Right. So since we're uh, busting some myths and creating new ones, Talk about the conspiracy theories on the lower price. In Washington, I apologize for my voice, but in Washington you hear it's, it's the U.S. and the Saudis conspiring against the Russians, or it's the, the, you know, the sheiks versus the, the shale producers. And there's general market explanations for this that are a lot more coherent and, and persuasive. Well, I think, uh, again, I go back to the supply-demand uh, fundamentals today. The, on the demand side, you know, we're seeing problems in Europe and low growth in Europe, and we're seeing moderating growth in, in the Asian, the real developing countries right. around Asia. So there is a demand, demand issue. Demand used to be growing about a million barrels per day. 
that's a kind of a healthy healthy demand, and we're off that uh, quite a bit in uh, as we came through the end of uh, 2014. And then with the supply overhang, the the increase in the unconventional production, Libya coming on, coming off, uh, Iraq has really built up a lot of lot of volume as well. That I think there is a there there's a fundamental supply demand overhang. There there is more supply than there is demand today, and when that happens. You fill up storage first, and when storage fills up, price has to come down. So I mean, it's it, it is the market at work now. Now, others have said, you know, uh, what about the Saudis, and are they trying to send a message to the shale oil production and the growth? I think generally there probably is a concern on the on the Saudis' part that, you know, we're not going to be just the only swing producer. Not only are other OPEC countries have to participate and reduce supply, but what about Russia? What about the U.S.? What about some of the non-OPEC countries as well? You're, you're contributing to the oversupply, you know, so we're not going to be the only okay. ones that, that, that make the correction to keep the price up. We're going we're gonna, to, we want everybody to participate in that. And, and we're not going to shut in production here in the U.S. because we're an open free market. But we are, we're an open free market. If we have low prices and less investment to make, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ultimately moderate the growth that we have in North America as well. That's another reason why we have to eliminate the different the 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 uh, uh, the difference between the WTI. This the this difference due to lack of exports is an artificial difference that's built into our system that doesn't need to be there, and and because we have that artificial difference due to the lack of exports, it's going to reduce the price, going to reduce the amount of cash flow companies get, and the amount of money we can reinvest to keep 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 it growing, and keep keep it going. So, but the real trade-off is going to be we needed a surge of demand to wipe away the surplus because if people, people keep producing and there's 500,000 barrel a day overhand each and every day overhang, yeah. that it just prolongs that. Yeah, I think on the front of it, that's right. I think it's, uh, we need to see the demand, uh, demand increase. And uh, the longer the price stays low, there will be some supply impact. Supply. But, it's, but I think we're all looking to see where, where demand goes in 2015 and 2016. Does it get back to more of a normal kind of does the whole globe, the, the economy of the whole globe start to grow again, uh, maybe similar to what we're, we're experiencing here in the U.S.? Excellent. I've got six more pages of questions, but I've always been told that I have to include everybody else. So the only questions or the only requirements we have um, to do this here is if you identify yourself, um, wait for the microphone because we've got a big crowd, and then you can make a comment, but if you can pose your question in the form of a question, that's always appreciated. And we will start with Jan. Back. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Cadario from the University of Toronto. I'd be interested, sir, in your um, in your uh, reaction to the possibility that lower oil and gas prices offer to governments to impose carbon taxes, and how that might. Uh, change your scenario, both in terms of uh, the prospects for the United States and also for the global markets. Thank you. So re, uh, rephrase, I, I didn't well, hear the first like, part. If, what? Fine. If, if prices fall, it's an opportunity for the United States and other countries that are concerned about uh, climate change to impose carbon taxes yes. by international agreement or, you know, however, that, that's not going to happen overnight, but nonetheless, it's an opportunity. And I'm wondering how that would affect the uh, very... Uh, uh, rosy and aggressive analysis you've offered. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think certainly uh, a, a carbon tax or something like that will be will be factored into the overall en energy equation. Will have some impact on the pace of development and the and the things that are happening in this industry. What I would remind everybody when you look at the macro energy environment or the the picture, both in North America and around the globe, what's happened with the shale revolution in the U.S. is we've we flattened the supply curve on natural gas. So as you look at the energy picture here, look at what we've done to greenhouse gas as an industry just over the last five years. We've taken the CO2 footprint in our industry in the U.S. down to 1970 levels, uh, you know, which, which the Kyoto Protocol envisioned or imagined a few years ago that we didn't think was even possible. So I think when you look at the macro and the total energy footprint and the total energy environment, that it has a place to play and a role to play in that. And uh, I think we're playing a very, very active role in that, also on, on the debate with, uh, with climate and, uh, and carbon. Okay, we have Senator Johnson up here in the front. Fernando. Yes, uh, Bennett Johnston. Uh, 
the White House recently facilitated the redefinition of some of the light ends as being eligible for export as refined products, some say up to a million barrels a day. John Podesta, White House Chief of Staff, was quoted as saying that satisfied his appetite for exports. My question is, does that cure the problem? And if not, why not? You know, it's a, it's a help, Senator. It, um, it does alleviate a problem that we're experiencing in the upper Texas Gulf Coast. And again, I, I go back to the geology and the, the nuances and the specifics of some of the developments we have. The Eagleford formation that we're developing in the, in the country is, is condensate prone, so it does, does help that. I question whether we'll ever grow to a million barrels a day of condensate production, but uh, so it helps but it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't answer the issue that, that we're gonna have coming at us as a nation with growing light black crude that our refineries cannot refine. So while it's a help, it, it by, by no stretch uh, solves the problem for us. We have to address the bigger issue. Okay, we're running out of time. So I'm gonna take uh, three questions quickly. We'll go uh, one in the back, second row, third row here, and then uh, you sir, right. Alan Kieswetter with Denton's. My question is, how can a one or two percent increase in, in overproduction produce a 50 percent or greater decrease in prices? It seems to be a disproportionality. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think, um, you know, that's the, uh, the volatility that we see in the business. And uh, I would say most of us in the industry are surprised that it's fallen as hard and as fast as it has. So I um, uh, don't know if I have a really good answer to that question other than that it doesn't feel like the fundamentals would support that, that kind of a fall. Um, what you worry about when it does that is that it comes back faster on the other end, similar to what it did in 2009 coming out of the recession. People were worried about the global economy, prices went to $30, $40 a barrel, and you know, just a matter of months later was back to $100 a barrel. And I think that that's the kind of volatility that we're in when we see these uh, imbalances that, cre that are created, even though they're relatively small in, in absolute terms, as, as, you, uh, as you so rightfully uh, quote. But, so I, I don't have a, a really good crisp answer. I, I just know that uh, that volatility is there. It is a commodity when demand picks up. You know, the old adage, the best thing for low oil prices are low oil prices because, you know, they, they do come back. It is a commodity when demand picks up and the supply and, and demand balance is not that significant. And we have seen this before. I mean, it's we under have. different conditions, but it's yeah. not a new phenomenon. Yeah. Okay, that's the second row up here, third row. Hi, Eric Hansen, a master's graduate from George Washington University. Um, given the outlook that you just gave on the energy market in the United States, what role do U.S. energy companies play in exploration and extraction endeavors in the Arctic? Um, and is, is, does it make economic sense? And are there any strategic or geostrategic implications to that? Yeah, so the Arctic is, uh, is an area that's uh, quite resource rich and it's, uh, it's prone, so companies do look at it. We, we've been operating for our company in particular been operating for over 40 years up in the North Slope of Alaska, so we have a lot of Arctic experience. What I would tell you is that, you know, we as a company, I think otherwise, other, other companies look at it and say these are, these are long life opportunities. So we have to take a very long term view of the oil price when we're making decisions about participation in the Arctic. It has a place to play in the role in the whole energy scheme and the, and the development. We've demonstrated that we can do it well. We've done it well for the last 40 years. We know how to do it. Um, I think uh, it'll play an important role, but it has to compete. And that's what the unconventionals have done for companies that, are, that have a position in the unconventionals. It's raised the bar on every other, portfolio, every other asset in your portfolio. So when, when, the, when, the, when it comes time to allocate capital, it has to compete. It has to compete on returns. It has to compete on other basis. And some of the Arctic is a little bit higher cost. Um, and, there's, and, and not all the Arctic is the same. So there's kind of tier three Arctic that is, uh, you know, frozen in, doesn't have seasonal access. There's seasonal access Arctic, and then there's sort of the northern part of the Barents Sea kind of Arctic that's open year round. So even not all the Arctic is, is the same. But what I tell you is in every company's portfolio, I know they're looking at it to make sure it competes on a cost of supply basis. 
and it will have a part in the energy mix, you know, if, if you think broadly over the next 30, 40, 50 years. Well, and because if you look at the conventional decline, we need to replace, what, four and a half million barrels a day just to yeah. stay yeah. even. Yeah, this business is a declining business, so we yeah. have to not only replace the decline, but grow right. to, to meet the growing demand. Okay, and then the fifth row on this side, Fernando? Two people competing. Well, we have two there. Okay. So, go ahead. And then if you'll pass the microphone directly in front of you, that'd be great. Daniel Bloom from we'll CQ Roll Call. Uh, the Obama administration came out with its plan to regulate methane today. Uh, ambitious target of 45% reduction below 2012 levels within the next 10 years. Can you talk about how that's going to affect your business operations and specifically your investment portfolio moving forward? Well, I um, don't know the, I can't really comment specifically about the investment portfolio. We'll need to see the rules. I don't, you know, I guess they're coming out later this year. I'd say a couple things maybe to that. I'm a little disappointed that uh, the voluntary program didn't get a little bit more airplay. I think uh, industry's already doing a lot of things to voluntarily uh, deal with the, uh, with the methane emissions problem. And so we'll have to, we'll have to see what, what, how the rules come out and how they're, how they're proclamated over the, over the course of the next year. But um, we're, we're incentivized to deal with methane emissions. We want to keep it in the pipes, keep it in the vessels, uh, because it's a sellable product. So uh, industry's working pretty hard to, to make sure that uh, we do the right things and we, and we, we attack the methane emissions. Okay. Hi, uh, Jeff Epping with Endages LLC. Um, we talked about the Arctic. Uh, maybe we can go to the other end of North America, or at least opposite North Slope. Mexico, how does Mexico fit into the uh, North American story? Well, I think it, it's got some huge potential. I think uh, it's. I think they're making all the right statements and moving to open up and try to attract uh, foreign direct investment into Mexico, and I think that's all a really good thing. Um, it goes similar to the Arctic question. I think uh, the 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 question we would have is just they need to make it competitive with the investment alternatives the companies have north of the border, either in the Gulf of Mexico in the Deepwater Province or in the Shale or the the onshore developments in Mexico. So they have a, they have a huge uh, opportunity in front of them to really uh, attract foreign capital where companies like mine will bring our people, our talent, our technology, our capital. Um, it, it does have to compete on a global scale. It has to compete against all the other opportunities that companies have in their global portfolio. And that's not the same for everybody. People are in a little different spot there, but certainly uh, companies like ours that have North American unconventional opportunity sets you know, the bar is pretty high, but uh, I think this does represent an interesting opportunity for the industry. They've got their resource-rich country as well, and there's some things they can do and are doing today to, uh, to attract that investment. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to those opportunities and, and the opportunity to go participate in Mexico. Does the lower price environment allow them to roll this out a little slower and maybe think through pieces, or is the politics too difficult? You know, I, I, it's a good question, Frank. I, I, don't, I don't know specifically. I think it probably just get, does give them a little bit of pause for concern um, in terms of how rapidly they want to attract investment, how mm -hmm. quickly it'll come at these kinds of commodity prices. It would certainly come quicker at higher and commodity higher prices. prices. So, Okay, we'll take one more question and we'll go on this side. It's you. Yeah, it's coming. Fernando just got a Fitbit for Christmas, and he's up to 2,000 steps. <laughs> Lee Fong from The Nation magazine. Uh, Mr. Lance, uh, how, how serious do you consider the threat of man-made climate change? And uh, one other question, the, um, the latest Congress uh, seems to be very sympathetic to many of your legislative priorities, such as the, approving the Keystone XL. Uh, did you or your company uh, give any donations, campaign donations, to the big undisclosed uh, groups that were very active in the election last year, these so-called uh, 501c4s or c6s? Thank well, we, we publicize all our contributions. You can go find them on our website or, you know, with Congress and what they, uh, and what, uh, what they publicize, too, so you can go see where, where, we, where, we, where we invest our money. Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all concerned about what's happening in terms of the climate change and the debate that's going on in the, in the world today, not only here in the United States, its impact on the energy, energy community. I would say our business is doing a lot to invest in, 
in, in, in the business to make it more sustainable, whether it's the oil sands, whether it's Gulf of Mexico Deep Water, whether it's the unconventionals. We're reducing our footprint, we're, we're cleaning up the product, we're uh, cleaning up the air, we're reducing fugitive emissions, we're concerned about greenhouse gases, and, and we're doing that as an industry. And I don't think, uh, my own personal mole, I don't think we get a near enough credit for some of the things that we are doing in this business. And I think it, uh, it has made an impact. Um, you look at the CO2 uh, in the air and you look at the, uh, the carbon footprint today, it's much less than it was four or five years ago, and directly attributable to the natural gas production that we've produced as a country. Well, and this is part of your gas story, so yeah. as regulatory costs come down, but the natural gas piece and the benefit to refiners as a feedstock and a fuel and to manufacturers has been a terrific story. Yep, absolutely. Right. One of the ways we get folks like Ryan is that we have promised to get them out by a certain time. There is a press briefing uh, or separate questions upstairs, and for those of you going to that, if you can wait by the elevator bank. But the rest of you, if you'll join me in, in thanking Ryan for taking the time to do this, because this has been spectacular from our point of view. And you can go back anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.